So basically, what you practice is what you get. What's of interest here is when the research first started coming out, um, looking at the effects of meditation, everybody went to their fam favorite form of meditation. There's a lot of research on transcendental meditation, and then others started being interested in MBSR. So everybody went, turned to their favorite form of meditation to see what it was doing in the brain. And they found something, and they reported it in the literature, and they continued with their research. Meanwhile, I'm reading all these various studies, and one person's proclaiming that it affects the left parietal part of the brain, and another person's claiming it affects the anterior cingulate cortex, definitively and only. And I'm thinking, but wait a minute, aren't you guys reading each other's research? Now, one study has come out, finally, comparing different forms of mindfulness practices. And there's an abundance of different kinds. And lo and behold, what you practice is what you get. If you're practicing a mantra-based meditation, then you will see effects in the parietal part of the brain that regulates language formulation. If you're practicing interoceptive awareness, as with um, yoga nidra, mindfulness meditation, then you will see effects in the anterior cingulate cortex and so forth. Um, if you are practicing um, ecstatic meditation, you'll see effects in the nucleus accumbens. So what you practice is what you get. So electroencephalography, I used to do EEG research at the VA hospital way back in the early 90s. Um, basically, we know that we have different brain states. Beta is your characteristic. We're probably all in the beta state right now, unless nobody's fallen asleep yet. Alpha is more relaxed, daydreaming state. Theta is a state that we normally pass through in those brief instances as we go from being awake, we've laid down in bed, we're awake, and then we get a little dreamy, and then we're gone. Theta is usually just passed through in a few moments. It's drowsy, peaceful, dreamy, um, and then we pass into delta, which is deep, slow wave sleep. And there's now some research on an even deeper form of sleep, which is gamma. But let's focus on these. Meditation, and again, depending on who the researchers were, early researchers said meditation puts you in the alpha state. Other researchers were saying, ah, meditation puts you in the theta state. Other researchers say, ah, meditation puts you in the delta state. Again, what you practice is what you get. Yoga nidra, nidra meaning sleep state, trance state, claims and aims to get people into the delta state, still conscious. So even, this is the, if you were ever in a meditation and you hear yourself snoring and you realize that's me snoring, you're in delta. Does that make sense? A lot of research has been done on theta as a healing state. If any of you are researchers interested in this, I would suggest that what might be happening is not just that theta is associated with healing, but that we spend too little time in theta, and that simply in balancing the amount of time we stand, spend in these various brain states is what our body needs. If we spend all our time in theta, we might be missing something crucial here. But we, we, we're looking for some kind of balance between these states, and that our culture, our lifestyle habits, doesn't give us enough time in theta. And so getting to spend some time there is helpful. So here are some studies that, sh that look specifically at the effects of meditation on increasing time spent in theta. Uh, we found increases in both theta and time spent in alpha with meditation practices. And moving on to yet another area of evidence for the mechanisms by which meditation is working. Epigenetics, perhaps one of the most fascinating. And I have some colleagues who work over at NIH at NCAM, and one of whom had, he had um, been in the pharmaceutical industry and come back to NCAM and called me all excited um, to learn more about meditation practices and mindfulness practices and research thereon. And I was really doing my best to be very convincing. Oh, you're going to find these meditation practices are doing so many things. Um, and I think at some point I reached a limit it was as to what he could actually believe that, that meditation could do. And then it was several months later, he called me and he said, it changes your genes. Mindfulness changes your genes. It reverses the aging process. 
meditation practices actually reverse the aging process. If we define the aging process as deterioration of the chromosomes, as the telomeres fall off the end and our chromosomes shorten due to a lack of an enzyme called telomerase, this shortening of our genes, our chromosomes, is referred to as the aging process. It's how we define it. Well, lo and behold, meditation increases telomerase levels. And as the enzyme levels increase again, again, that being part, one of the biomarkers of aging, as we reverse that decline in telomerase levels and increase it, then it again begins to lengthen, the, putting the telomeres back on the chromosomes, re-lengthening them, literally reversing the aging process. And people who have taken to meditation practices can have reported many symptomatic effects that feel like they feel younger, they look younger, memory improves, and so forth. So this fits with the clinical outcomes. <clears throat> and uh, I don't think I have a slide on this, but one of the things in using telomerase as a measure of effects of meditation is telomerase is wonderful when you're talking about normal healthy cells. But then there were, there's lots of ways of increasing telomerase levels. All of the lifestyle factors play a role, obviously. Um, so there was some concern, well, what if we increase telomerase levels for cancer cells? Wouldn't that be a bad thing? And of course, that would. It was actually an acupuncture study that came along and looked at the effects of acupuncture on telomerase in healthy cells and in cancer cells and found that acupuncture differentially affected the cells. So the healthy cells got longer, more telomerase levels in the healthy cells, lower telomerase levels in the cancer cells, and the cancer cells more inclined to apoptosis. So um, I don't know if we can translate from acupuncture to other mind-body practices as well, but the suggestion is there that there is the potential for differential effects, positive effects in the healthy cells and negative effects in the malignant cells. <clears throat> so some of the functional clinical outcomes of meditation that are associated with all these specific mechanisms are obviously significant and effective uses of mindfulness and other mind-body practices in treatment of pain and associated depression and mood disorders. And now we've seen some of the mechanisms of how. Anxiety, ADHD, substance abuse. The evidence basis is, is abysmal for treatment of substance abuse, and yet the evidence basis for use of meditation is phenomenal. So I suggest if any of you are involved in um, substance running or treatment in substance abuse programs, look into it. Um, we're seeing effects in terms of treating cancer. I just heard on the radio driving over here um, the trauma and stress associated with the diagnosis of cancer and perhaps uh, some 44% of people um, are suffering now PTSD just from hearing the words, you have cancer. And yet there's some wonderful studies on the use of mindfulness pre-diagnosis for people. People who were suggested to join a meditation program pending their diagnosis, none of them suffered from these traumatic effects of receiving a positive diagnosis of cancer. And the measures in these studies were um, clinical outcomes and um, immune function. Immune system function plummets when people receive that diagnosis. Just when you really need your immune system working for you, uh, it plummets. And yet people who were meditating did not have that effect. Every single risk factor for heart disease is positively impacted by meditation and yoga. And we have, it may probably other mind-body practices, but we have research studies showing every risk factor for heart disease improves with these practices. I mentioned eczema simply because that was just one of the very first areas that was researched in terms of the effects of mindfulness. Um, flu, the incidence of flu is greatly decreased. And for people who receive a vaccine for flu, it's far more effective than people who are meditating. And I put this slide up because this is a, another area that I do research in and work, and we're actually going to be doing a big clinical trial starting in November. You can check on the Mindfulness Center's website for more details about this. But I listed here the diagnostic criteria for ADHD. 
um, according to the DSM. These are the criteria by which ADHD is defined. Then I went, this was, I made this slide about seven years ago before there was any research in the field. So I went to the research that existed on the effects of meditation, the clinical outcomes, the behavioral outcomes for meditation. And I made a list of them. And one for one, I lined them up. They are the exact opposite. So whereas ADHD is the inability to attend to details or making careless mistakes, the effects of meditation is improved executive functioning and so forth. Difficulty sustaining attention, increased attention regulation, as we talked about the role of the anterior cingulate cortex in, in uh, attention regulation and so forth. So the evidence would suggest that mindfulness practices would be one of the ideal um, therapies to put in the arsenal of treatment. And I know a lot of parents who have kids with ADHD are very concerned about the medications, um, the addictive potential, and the fact that the research only suggests the use of medication for short periods of time, um, not long-term use. So then what do we do? Meditation provides lifelong skills that people can use to treat these symptoms. So this is a summary, and I believe you have handouts, and I included a lot of information so that you could return to your handouts for this, but a summary of the mechanisms and the portions of the brain that regulate these various mechanisms through which mindfulness works. So what is it? So great. We know it's wonderful for your health. And we've got all the brain science you could possibly imagine and other medical science behind these practices. Now the question is, wait a minute, what exactly is it that I'm supposed to do? What is the part of the practice? Is it the fact that you sit there for an hour and your knees hurt and your back is aching? No, don't do it that way. <laughs> that's not working. Is it the fact that your eyes are closed? That's a little bit helpful, but that's not the big thing. Is it the fact that you're not doing something else? Here's what it is that's really working. Interoceptive self-awareness. Focusing inward. What's going on inside? There's a lot going on there. There's your breathing. That's a wonderful stimulus to focus on because as long as it matters, it's available. We can all detect ourselves breathing. Heartbeat is another, but I find only about 50% of the people can feel their own pulse. That might increase as you practice, but at least breath is always there. There's other forms of meditation, the mantra meditation, uh, focusing on a candle or a chime or something like that. What I like about a breath-focused meditation is if I'm driving down the road and somebody just about runs me off of the road, my heart rate goes up, I don't have to pull over and light a candle to calm down. I can just go, I'm still breathing, <laughs> and there it is, calm down. Or if I'm in a tense board meeting or something, I don't have to say excuse me and start saying my mantra. I can just go, I'm still breathing, and there we go. So it's interoceptive awareness. There's all kinds of other things you'll find when you get in there. Um, all the stuff you've been resisting in life, all the stuff you've been suppressing, it'll come up. That's okay. The second important thing is to notice it with self-compassion, to accept it when it arises. Say, oh yeah, that pain, I remember that. Oh yeah, that memory, oh yeah, that issue. Whatever it is, a physical or emotional issue, they'll come up. That's them being released. Think about when you stretch. Ever stretch your hamstrings? What do you find when you do that? Pain's in there. The stretching is the release of that pain, yeah? Do we go, ooh, that hurts, I'm not gonna do that anymore? No, because then you're gonna walk around with tension chronically in your hamstrings, yeah? You breathe, you say, oh yeah, there's some tension, but I'm letting it out. Ah, and you let it go. Same thing in your meditation practices. Oh yeah, there's that ugly memory. It's being released. We become conscious of what we're releasing sometimes as it's released. It's okay. So these two things are what the research is showing are the key ingredients to the mindfulness practices. I'd like to add something else, and that is the use of the breath. As, as Gary mentioned, one of the things that can lead to inflammation of the brain is lack of oxygen. And my last minute here, I'll, I'll mention a study. One of my 
I can go. One of my um, graduate students deviated from our course of, of looking at mind-body practices to improve well-being and suggested that we might actually stress subjects out and see what's going on, which I said, no, 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 we're not going to do that. <laughs> That's old school. Um, we're now looking into so solutions, not how to cause the problem and what the problem is associated with. We know enough about the problem. But they did mention, oh, well, we could stress them out this way. We could stress them out that way. One of the standard procedures for inducing stress in research is to deprive people, is to expose people to carbon dioxide. So this, say she said, it's really very simple. We'll just expose them to carbon dioxide. We'll elicit the stress response. So may I suggest that not holding your breath might elicit the relaxation response. And if you're not holding your breath, what are you doing? You're breathing deeply. You're taking in oxygen. Yeah? I have another friend who um, doesn't live in the area, and her mother has been going through years and years of different cancer care and then treatment for pain after her cancer treatments and so forth. And she's just had a relapse and was in the hospital. And she'd been in for a month and a half because her oxygen levels, her blood oxygen levels, were too low to be released or to continue with her chemo. And she'd been on an oxygen tent for six weeks. And I talked with my friend. And she's like, what can I do? She's in so much pain. And I said, well, I, I can't teach you everything over the phone, but just have her do some deep breathing exercises. Just, just get her breathing in and breathing regularly and watching her breath. I think you can do that. And she came back to me and she said, you know, I had mom doing these breathing exercises and the nurses came up to me afterwards and they said, what were you doing? She's been here for six weeks because she has low oxy blood oxygen levels and all of a sudden her blood oxygen levels have come back up to normal. Does the word duh come to mind? <laughs> if you're holding your breath, even if you're in an oxygen tent, you're not going to be getting that oxygen in and that carbon dioxide out, right? So do some deep breathing exercises. So I would like to add to what I've seen in the literature so far, just because it hasn't been researched doesn't mean it might not be true, that the use of the breath is a specific tool. So interoceptive awareness, compassion when you get there, and breathing. So how do we select the brain state of our choice? What do you choose? Practice that. What you practice is what you get. Does that make sense? <clears throat> what are your intentions? Consider your intentions. Consider your beliefs. How do we access the placebo effect? If the placebo effect is the power of what you believe, how do we access the power of what you believe? Some of our beliefs are conscious. And some of our beliefs are subconscious. The conscious ones, we can manipulate. How about the subconscious ones? We don't even know what they all are. What's meditation? The practice of expanding the consciousness. What's the number one part of the practice that's working? Increased awareness, increased consciousness. So as we expand what's in the subconscious into the consciousness, and our consciousness expands, we now have ready access to those beliefs, to those intentions, to the power of the placebo effect. And I say that with honor for the concept of the placebo, not denigrating it as some nuisance factor in our research studies, but because it is the power of what we believe the most potent healing tool out there in all of the research that's been done, the most potent tool. <clears throat> the power of the mind. Thank you so much. <laughs>